Hello, and welcome to the Science of Terragenesis. Episode 5, Oxygen. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn, founder of Edgeworks Entertainment and creator of Terragenesis. A quick note before we get started today. In a few weeks, we're going to be doing our first Q&A episode, in which I'll be answering questions sent in by you, our listeners. You can ask about the game, about the podcast, about the science of terraforming or space exploration, anything you want. So if you've got a question you'd like to be included, send it over to info at edgeworksentertainment.com. I can't wait to answer your questions. Talking to our fans is my favorite part of this job. Today we're going to be talking about the third major metric in any terraforming effort, oxygen. Or to put it more broadly, atmospheric composition. In casual terms, we often say that Earth's atmosphere is made up of oxygen, but that's really not very true. Oxygen only makes up 21% of Earth's atmosphere. The vast majority of Earth's atmosphere, 78% in fact, is actually nitrogen. There's also 1% argon, and then trace amounts of carbon dioxide, neon, helium, methane, krypton, hydrogen, nitrous oxide, xenon, ozone, iodine, carbon monoxide, ammonia, and more. Atmospheric composition, by the way, is often measured in ppm, or parts per million, but that's just a fancy way of saying percent. One million ppm is the same as 100%. The air we breathe is a mix of many different gases, and that mixture has changed over the course of our planet's history. That being said, most of those gases are what are called inert gases, which means that they don't actually interact with your body when you breathe them in. They're just filler. They help increase the atmospheric pressure, but don't actually do anything for you biologically. The main component of breathable air that humans care about is oxygen, specifically the O2 molecule that we need to breathe. Which begs the question, why do we need O2 to breathe? What function does oxygen serve in the human body? Well, contrary to many people's assumptions, breathing O2 in is actually the less important step in human respiration. The more important function is breathing CO2 out. The O2 molecule's primary function is that it helps carry carbon out of the body when you exhale. This is a bit of an oversimplification, of course, but you can think of oxygen a lot like the empty rail carts you see in old-timey mine shafts or in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Just like those carts are designed to be filled with rock and sent back out of the mine, oxygen is brought into the body specifically so that it can be filled up with carbon and then sent back out into the air. Carbon atoms are detached from proteins, sugars, and other molecules during your body's biological operations, and breathing is one of the ways that we get rid of that excess carbon. In fact, when you're on a diet and you're losing weight, most of that weight is actually exhaled through your lungs as the fat cells are broken down. Humans need a constant supply of oxygen, or we begin to die within seconds. But it's not enough to simply have oxygen. You also need it to be absorbed at the right rate into the body. It's entirely possible in an artificial environment to get too much oxygen too fast, which results in something called hyperoxygenation or hyperoxia, the symptoms of which can include everything from disorientation and nausea to blindness and even death. That's where those inert gases come in. They dilute the oxygen we breathe to a level where we can handle it. 21% oxygen is the sweet spot for humans because that's the normal level on Earth. In most situations, people breathe an oxygen-nitrogen mixture, again, because it's the norm for Earth's atmosphere. But it is possible to breathe other mixtures. Inert gases are inert. They don't have an effect on the body, so they can be swapped without much difference. For example, some scuba divers have experimented with oxygen-argon mixtures, called argonox, without any ill effects, aside from the fact that it's harder to make, so why bother? But the relative levels of argon in Mars's atmosphere have led some people to suggest that it could work as a replacement for nitrogen in future Martian settlements. You can even breathe oxygen-helium mixtures, called heliox, so long as you don't mind your voice sounding like you joined the cast of Alvin and the Chipmunks. Fun fact, some scuba divers use heliox because it generates less resistance in the lungs and makes breathing easier. 
And there's actually a special device called a helium descrambler that they use to artificially lower their voices back down to their natural pitch so they can talk while diving. There are dozens of breathable gas mixtures that work just as well as natural air. The key is just the ratio of oxygen to inert gases rather than the particular inert gas you use. In fact, you can actually breathe a mixture of oxygen and nothing at all if the ratio is right. The astronauts in the Gemini and Apollo missions back in the earliest days of manned spaceflight experimented with using 100% oxygen at 21% pressure rather than 21% oxygen at 100% pressure, and it worked just as well. It was also great for spaceship design, since containing only one-fifth the air pressure put 80% less strain on the ship's hull and lowered the risk of leaks and decompression. And it meant they didn't need to carry large, heavy tanks of useless nitrogen just to dilute the O2 in the air. In certain situations, this pure oxygen, low-pressure configuration is still used, but it fell dramatically out of favor after Apollo 1 caught fire on January 27, 1967. Fire can spread really, really fast in an all-oxygen environment, and sadly, the entire crew of Apollo 1 lost their lives. These days, the attitude is mostly that the risks of a pure oxygen environment outweigh the benefits. The basics of air mixture and oxygen ratios aren't restricted to astronauts. They're familiar to anyone who has learned to scuba dive on vacation. In general, casual scuba divers are breathing with tanks filled with regular old air. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. The exact same thing we breathe on the surface. They literally just pump it into the tanks from the surrounding environment. But with an extra certification, some scuba divers use slightly higher ratio oxygen mixes called nitrox, which can be 32 or 36% oxygen. This helps alleviate several potential problems that come with scuba diving, such as decompression sickness or the bends, and anecdotally helps with post-dive fatigue. It can be tricky using artificially enriched air, but with the proper training, it does have several benefits. Of course, humans aren't the only life forms that interact with oxygen in the atmosphere. As every school kid knows, animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, but plants do exactly the opposite. They can take in carbon dioxide and release pure breathable O2. That's how our atmosphere maintains its balance in what's known as the carbon cycle. So what makes plants so special? Why do they get to make oxygen while we can't? And where did all the oxygen in our atmosphere come from anyway? The answer is photosynthesis. Using a special pigment called chlorophyll, plants and algae are able to use the energy from the sun's light to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. The plant keeps the sugar as food and releases the oxygen as a waste product. Chlorophyll absorbs mostly the blue and red portions of the light spectrum, which is why plants and algae appear so vividly green. That middle portion of the spectrum, which we perceive as green, is the only color getting reflected back into our eyes. So long as a plant is receiving sunlight and has access to carbon dioxide and water, it can photosynthesize them into food and release oxygen in the process. One of the questions we get all the time is, why is there a minimum oxygen requirement for plant life in pterogenesis? If plants make their own oxygen, shouldn't they be able to survive without any in the atmosphere? The answer is that photosynthesis requires light, and as such can only happen while the sun is out. When the sun sets and the plant is in darkness, it lives through respiration just like a human, consuming oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. As such, even plants will require a certain amount of oxygen in the atmosphere of a new planet before they can survive on the surface. So, if all our oxygen comes from plants and algae performing photosynthesis, where did that oxygen come from in the first place? How did our 21% oxygen atmosphere get its oxygen before there were plants and algae to make it? The answer is, it didn't exist. The atmosphere of the early Earth was choked with carbon dioxide, utterly deadly to modern life. It wasn't until very early microscopic life forms called cyanobacteria came along and first began performing photosynthesis 
that significant amounts of oxygen began to gather in the atmosphere. These cyanobacteria and their descendants in the form of plants and algae ended up transforming the entire atmosphere of our planet. And when they did, they almost killed off all the life on Earth. You see, oxygen is an incredibly destructive element. Not only is it a key component of fire, it's also incredibly corrosive. Ever wonder why steel bridges are always painted, like the bright orange of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco? It's to protect the steel from corrosion, which could destroy the whole bridge in a matter of decades. In fact, the reason Mars is known as the Red Planet is because of iron oxide, also known as rust, covering the surface of the planet. Life on Earth had evolved to survive in a non-oxygenated environment, and when the cyanobacteria began to release oxygen over the course of millions and millions and millions of years, it created what's called the Great Oxygenation Event about two and a half billion years ago. So many species of early life forms were driven to extinction during this period that it is sometimes known as the oxygen catastrophe or even the oxygen holocaust. Luckily, evolution did its thing, and a few life forms developed systems for dealing with the excess oxygen in the air, and ultimately came to rely on it like we do today. But far from being a boring and ever-present element in our air, the history of oxygen on Earth is full of dramatic swings and unexpected twists. Which brings us back to terraforming, and the need to create oxygen-rich atmospheres for human settlement. Technically, so long as the temperature and air pressure are acceptable, humans could survive on a planet with simple oxygen masks. But that would be no way to live. So any terraforming effort necessarily involves striking the right mix of oxygen and inert gases to be breathable by humans, animals, plants, and all the other species we plan to bring with us. Among the atmospheres of our solar system, Earth is the only one with significant O2 levels. Again, we have our native cyanobacteria to thank for that. Mars and Venus both have atmospheres dominated by carbon dioxide, which, while poisonous to humans as is, does have the potential to be efficiently converted into O2 through photosynthesis. Many terraforming proposals treat the atmosphere as basically a two-step process. Thicken the CO2 to warm up the planet and reach acceptable pressure, then let the plants and algae do their thing. It will obviously be more complicated than that in practice, but the availability of plant life as automatic and efficient oxygenators will be a huge help in the mid and late stages of terraforming. In terragenesis, as with the other metrics, we have three facilities for increasing the oxygen level of your planet and three for decreasing it. On most real worlds, the task will be to increase oxygen levels. And to start out, we have a facility called the oxygen plant. This is a factory-type structure that processes other chemicals, such as carbon dioxide, into breathable oxygen. After that, players can unlock the cyanovats, which use cyanobacteria to photosynthesize O2 using natural processes, just like they do on Earth. And finally, a kelp farm will get your oxygenation efforts really moving quickly. To this day, 50 to 85% of the atmospheric oxygen on Earth is produced by algae and kelp in the oceans, not by forests or grasslands on land. So algae will be a very potent tool in producing atmospheric oxygen on Mars. If you end up overdoing it and needing to reduce your oxygen levels, we've got you covered there too. An O2 filter is your first step, a simple machine for processing O2 into other compounds for industrial use. After that, we have a facility called the Carbon Fixer, which acts like human lungs on fast forward, attaching carbon atoms to O2 to produce CO2, which thickens the atmosphere and warms up the planet. And finally, a hydro generator will take your O2 molecule and add four hydrogen atoms to make two water molecules, or H2O. This will help lower your oxygen levels while also producing water for your burgeoning hydrosphere. Speaking of which, that's where we'll be focusing our discussions next week on the fourth and final key metric for terraforming, water. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Science of Terragenesis. 
Be sure to send in your questions to info at edgeworksentertainment.com to be included in the upcoming episode. That's info at edgeworksentertainment.com. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe for more episodes, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and Discord at Terragenesis Game, on Twitter at twitter.com slash settle the stars, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. You can also check us out at edgeworksentertainment.com and terragenesisgame.com. And don't forget to leave a review for the podcast. It really does help. And if you haven't played it yet, be sure to check out the indie terraforming game Terragenesis, which is a free download on iOS, Android, and the Microsoft Store. I'm Alexander Wynn. Thanks for listening, folks. And as always, happy terraforming.